Lovely. So, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Leading Your International Schools podcast. I'm the guest host for uh, episode six. My name is Barry Cooper. So this is a podcast that aims to bring you practical tips and practices to make a leadership journey uh, a more memorable one and hopefully a more successful one. The podcast is brought to you as well by TIC Recruitment and TIC Recruitment, as many of you will know, have been helping qualified teachers and leaders find the right international school and jobs for nearly 20 years. So TIC works exclusively with leading international schools to find the best teachers and school leaders from around the world. Now, this week, I'm very excited uh, because I've read some of her stuff is we're being joined by Dr. Jill Berry. Now, Jill, and I, I'm going to give you a, just a, a, a taster of her career, taught for 30 years across six different schools, UK state, independent adults and children, um, head for the last 10 years of her career. Uh, since 2010, she's completed a doctorate researching the transition to headship, written a book about it called Making the Leap. Um, she's also uh, carried out a range of extensive leadership development work, given TED Talks, uh, also published three short novels. She's an advocate for the opportunities presented by social media and networking. You'll see her on Twitter, Twitter uh, Jill Berry 102 and blogging about education at Jill Berry 102. Uh, dot blog so do check her out on online um so today i'm gonna say jill jill are you with us i am i am <laughs> fantastic um thank you so much for being with us today i uh, as as a, as a guest host i've got a feeling i can get away with more um than perhaps the regular host so i i'd love to turn this into what should be a, an interesting conversation about the the book chapter that you you selected so do you want to tell um us a little bit about the chapter you selected why you selected it and, and what your your interest in in that is I will. Um, the chapter that I selected is chapter six, which is all about school culture, building a school culture. And although the book is leading your international school, I think everything that the chapter has to say about culture is relevant to to any school in any context. So I'm interested in school culture. I'm interested in what it is, how we establish it, how it might evolve over time, and particularly what that means for a new head coming in and stepping into the legacy of their predecessor, how they can establish themselves and build on what they inherit to keep the school culture very strong. Oh, well, that's that's probably a great question to start with. Um, what is the right way to step into a culture? So how can you, you respect the legacy and the environment as you step into a both either a school that's extant or perhaps a new country um, and as you step into it as head? What's the right way to step into that culture? I think you put your finger on the, the point when you talked about respect and uh, respecting the legacy, respecting what you inherit. You mentioned my doctorate. When I stepped back from headship, I embarked on this doctorate. And the focus was particularly making the transition from deputy to head. So it wasn't just about headship. It was about that, that move, that leap from being a deputy to being a head. And I had six research participants who were all deputy heads, but they'd been appointed to their headship. So they were in the lead in period between securing the job and actually taking up the role and I tracked their progress through the final few months of their deputy headship into the first months of their headship. Now I'd been through that process myself 10 years before and one of the things I think we a trap we tend to fall into we, we assume that our experience is fairly typical and I discovered from working with my six participants that it wasn't necessarily I was very very fortunate that my predecessor was invested in supporting me and helping me make the most successful transition but not all my participants were so so lucky so thinking about the the dynamic between the outgoing head and the incoming head thinking about this idea of what you inherit it's never a blank canvas but how you move from inheriting to inhabiting the role and making it your own putting your own stamp on it i think is quite demanding <coughs> You do need to be very mindful, I think, of the legacy. 
Sorry, Barry, I've got a cough. I'm just no, taking I can, I'm, I'm happy to fill in with about 15 subsidiary <laughs> questions to that. That's super, super interesting. Grab a glass of water. I think the one of the the, the interesting things <laughs> there is when you you talk about this idea of inhabiting culture and, and the support you need from perhaps local stakeholders who've been invested in that culture. So where, if someone's coming into a new culture, be it a new school or a new country, where can they look for, for that support to, to get a sense of what the culture is, how it operates, where are the pitfalls? Because often these are these are booby traps that we we stumble into and we don't quite understand why we've suddenly in, enraged a, a parent body or enraged a student body or enraged a staff body. Where do we go to get that that sense of the of the place? I think when we go through the selection process, we need to be very insightful and discriminating. I think we need to make sure that the ethos that we will pick up if we become the head is something that aligns with our own principles and priorities and beliefs. When when you say um, kind of principles and beliefs, is that when I mean are we moving towards talking about things like purpose for the for the school? So could we are we tying um, um, the, the the purpose of the school to the culture of the school? I think I think they are very closely aligned. So I think purpose and culture is about what you believe, what you stand for, what you think education is all about, and what makes your particular school distinctive. So during the process, you get lots of information. You will talk to your governing board, however that's constituted. I know in some international schools, it's quite a different model of governance to some UK schools, but but there are people there who are invested in the school who are in effect your employers. You need to make sure that the relationship with them is constructive and positive. Um, you need to do your reading, your research. You need to talk to people who know the school. And then in the lead in period, if you are appointed, it's a great opportunity to start to learn more, to begin to establish yourself, to build those relationships with all members of the wider school community you know, with the staff with your senior team with the governors to get to know parents to get to know students and all that is part of the process i think of tuning into the context the culture the country the working practices the customs i think you need to be very well informed you need to try to understand because that's what you are building on barry and i think it takes a degree of humility to know that you are not coming in as the messiah who's going to transform everything. <laughs> You're going to work with the community that's already there, some of whom may have been invested in that community for a long time and who will know a lot more about it than you do. And you work to get the best from them, working with them. You need to win their respect. But I think it starts with being very mindful of the relationship with your predecessor and not rushing in where fools fear to tread. Oh, no, angels fear to tread, is it? Whoever, uh, so, uh, well, don't it, yeah, don't don't look before you leap. I think is the is I suppose is the uh, the idea that you're you're expressing. I think it's it's really interesting. You named a, a number of different kind of stakeholders there who you you need to deal with as a as a head. And I think there's there's more and more, and they 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 fragment as well. I think as you uh, go through the process of of coming on board or building a school, um, one of the key ones I've always found, and I'm I'm a big fan of of thinking of uh, the parent body and the parents association as kind of a little superpower that schools can have if they're used in the right way. How, how important are parents in either dictating the culture of an environment of a school or in helping a head or a leadership team reimagine and, and change and drive a new kind of culture at the school? I think dictating is an interesting word. I would say no one should actually dictate the culture, including the, the new head. You do not come in as the new head and say, right, I am now imposing this set of vision values or beliefs or priorities. I'm importing them. This is what I believe. Therefore, this is how the school is going to operate. Because you have to be able to win trust. You have to be able to win hearts and minds and get people on board. And that means staff, governors, students and parents and prospective parents as well. Those parents who may be looking to buy into that school community 
at some stage in the near future. I think we have to listen to parents. I think we need, need to be able to empathize and try to understand. Um, no matter how demanding sometimes parents might be, usually they're motivated by love for their child, which is absolutely as it should be. And they have to respect that we have a slightly different perspective because we're professionals and we care about all the students in our school. So we have to find ways of working together. I think in the past, some schools have very much tried to keep parents at arm's length. I don't think that's the right thing to do. I don't think that's a reasonable thing to do. They are investing in your institution. They deserve more than that. And it is about collaboration, collaboration and consultation. But ultimately, the head and governors will make decisions. If the parents seem to be driving the direction of the school, I think you're in trouble. Yeah, I, I think I think you're absolutely right. I think the that that idea of driving and dictating, I think, is quite I think I probably use quite an old fashioned in my head. I had quite an old fashioned kind of view of of heads, you know, imagining the, the first heads that I ever worked for. Um, do you think leadership needs to change in order to to work in the 21st century? Are we moving away from that? dare I say, quite you know, male-centred, aggressive, um, hierarchical system towards something a bit more inclusive? I think we are, and I think we have been for some time. Um, I became a head in 2000. It's 23 years on from that now. And I think I have seen leadership change during my whole career. I started teaching in 1980. Um, I think it is more inclusive. I think it's more diverse. Um, and I think it's also more informed I think we're research informed we know a lot more not only about how students learn but about how successful leaders lead so I think it is changing and I think it should continue to do so I'm a huge fan of flexible education flexible working in education and I think the pandemic made a difference because I think sometimes things that people said couldn't be done we discovered that they could be done because we had to do things remotely and we had to be much more flexible yeah. in our operational practices. I think that's one way of showing that you value your staff. You are prepared to consider flexible working when people need it, rather than feeling that won't work in education. It's not good for the students. The parents won't like it. It's, it's expensive. It'll open the floodgates. It can't be timetabled. I think all those things are myths. And actually, there's a lot of good case study evidence now about how we can be more flexible and I think leaders at all levels need to be prepared to be flexible rather than trying to squeeze people into tight boxes so yeah I think it's changing already Barry and it will continue to do so and, and changing for the better I would say. Um, I, I, I think you're right, definitely right I think the um, I've always been a, I, coming from a quite traditional background um, but from a, a services background, I think leadership as service has always been something that that struck me as a as a core tenet. Um, I I've had a, a few interesting conversations over the past um, few weeks with uh, those involved in online schools. Um, so Hugh Vinnie, for example, who operates uh, Minerva, uh, which is a, a small um, uh, online school coming through in in the UK, for example, and um, these wholly online schools is there a is there a an issue do you think in terms of creating culture when students are scattered either across the country or in some cases in Minerva's case for example across the globe how do you how do you dig in and try to um encourage and guide and shape culture when you are literally scattered across you know 24 time zones I think it has its challenges, but I think it can be done. I've been doing lots of online professional development work since the, the start of the pandemic, and I'm still doing some alongside face-to-face -face work now. I think it can be designed so that it is warm and human and interactive, that people are fully engaged, that relationships are built, that humour is there. Um, so I, I think we, we have to think about how we can adapt perhaps an online context, in such a way that relationships are still prioritised, communication is strong, um, respect is, is mutual and built on. Obviously, in some cases, in a global context, perhaps it's the only way you can bring people together. I think when there is the possibility of some face-to-face -face interaction 
at some stage. So if I do an online course and have the opportunity to meet with participants face to face at the beginning and perhaps at the end and have online sessions in between, that blended model, I think, works very well. Um, but we adapt, don't we? We have to yeah. adapt. And I think COVID was a great example of how something unexpected happened and we had to pivot very nimbly in order to ensure that students got good provision and that parents were supported and that we focused on, well, Jeff Barton of the Union Askell talked about this in a Guardian article very early in the pandemic. He said, we have to keep asking what matters most. And I think we're still asking that question. His answer was the human stuff. He said yeah. to him, the human stuff matters most. And that is very central to the idea of purpose and culture, I think, Barry. I think I think that's that's a really interesting um, uh, way of expressing it. I think often when we we look at uh, schools, we say what matters most, and we say well, it's the kids. But I think when we start thinking about schools as communities and as these collections of relationships, I think the human stuff, you know, even if if expressed like that, but it's it's about those relationships, isn't it? It's about the people, it's about the the teachers, the parents, the I mean the stakeholders as well, if they've invested in in what you're doing, if they have a, a vested interest in 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 the college, in its success for whatever reason. It's it's about that that series of interactions i think one of the the other things you mentioned i mean you talked about covid which obviously was and i remember you know being in you know, dubai and having to design a you know an online school overnight um which i i'd say now was terrible and we had to innovate and adapt and adapt and adapt and still until we got it right um during the the time we were out of school um in in 2020 but the i think one of the interesting things is that is is culture something that is vital in those tough times is it is culture the thing we should go to when you know the uh you know covid happens or in a crisis or you know uh, for whatever reason is it the the touchstone that we need is that where we go I would say yes. Interestingly another covid um story there was some concern I remember that COVID was forcing schools to be far more operational. It was very difficult to be strategic and to look ahead because the future was so uncertain. Um, and someone called Michael Payne, who, who runs a company called Forum Education UK, he wrote a very powerful um, article called Purpose is the New Strategy. And he said, at the moment, we need to go back to our purpose. We need to revisit our beliefs, our values, our culture. And so that will guide us in these uncharted waters. And I think schools did exactly that. So it is about knowing what we believe in. And that's not just as an individual, it's as an organization. So all the members of the wider community are aware of, of what your beliefs are, what your priorities are. They've bought into that, they're invested in that. It's well articulated, it's well communicated, it's understood within the school and beyond the school. And that can be a very powerful touchstone when we hit bumps in the road, because we will always hit bumps in the road. Um, <laughs> Daily. There, actually, there was a particular quotation in, in the book, in chapter six of the book, um, that I liked about this. Um, and it was the idea about Culture is the glue that binds people together during tremendous times of need. The glue that binds people together. That was in Andre and Warren's book, Leading Your International School. And I thought that said it well. If you are clear about your vision and values, then when you have to make difficult decisions, there is something to help guide you. Um, and that, I think, is why culture is so important. It's not a nice to have. It's not a cherry on the top. It's fundamental to the way in which our schools operate. Um, I that's I think that's super interesting. That that it's a fun. It's fundamental. You know that I mean, you take the root of the word. It's you know the fundament, the very base on which we we build our our, our castle, build our edifice. Um, the in international education, especially where there are private investors setting up international schools, private investors setting up private schools, wherever wherever it may be, it could be in the UK, it could be in America, it could be in the Middle East, Africa, Asia, you know, Europe, wherever. Um, should should culture be 
a USP, for example? Should culture be something where you say, this is how we do things and this is different to anywhere else? Or is that perhaps slightly dangerous approach and taking us down a, a route of experimentation rather than focusing on what we're there to do, which is education and helping students, you know, become. That's what schools are for. They're, they're places for becoming. I think experimentation is good. I think risk taking is good. I think if we try to stand still, we will inevitably slide backwards. Um, it, it seems to me that, well, certainly in the independent sector, schools are businesses. They have to be run in a business-like way because if they don't, they won't thrive or even survive in the current climate. And there's nothing wrong, really, with making sure that we are business-like in our, in our practices if we're very clear about what it is we believe, we're very clear about our moral purpose. I do think all schools are different. It's interesting, Barry, and sometimes people say every school's the same. And if you look at website claims, sometimes schools sound very much the same. But I have been into a lot of schools in my life, and I would say every school is subtly different. There is nuance there. I think understanding what distinguishes your school from others, particularly perhaps your competitors, if you're in a competitive market, mm is key but communicating that so that it's well understood by people within the school who then can spread that word beyond the school I think is 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 really important if you're trying to find the right school for your for your child it isn't helpful if all schools try to be the same I think if people are clear this is what we believe this is what we prioritize if it's not right for your son or daughter, then that's fine. You need to know that. And there may be a better option for you out there. But if it will suit your child, if we can help your child be the best they can be, then we want you to understand us, to know that, to look at us, to get to know us better and to make a choice based on that. So I think having having a USP, not in a gimmicky way or a, mm. a, a contrived way, but saying oh, this this is... This is how we live in this school, not just what we say. So your, um, your culture isn't just espoused, it's actually embraced. Um, Mary Myatt, I always remember, she says she was quoting Contender Charlie, but I always associate this with Mary Myatt, said your values need to be lived, not just laminated. <laughs> I really like that. I, I love that, yeah. No, absolutely. Well, that's, that leads me on to my, my next thought, which is for... And this is, I suppose, is for everyone. It's for students. It's for potential teachers uh, who are looking at teaching in a new school and for parents who are looking for education. When we walk into a school, how do we understand the culture? Where do we look to get a sense of this is how they do things? This is them. Um, How can we spot the red flags? How can we spot the big green flags that say, yeah, okay, this is my kind of place? I think we, we notice we have our antenna finely tuned. We are listening and learning and looking and sometimes reading between the lines. Um, it's helpful if schools can be fairly clear about what their priorities are. But it's also in, and the, the book talks about this, the power of narrative and the power of stories. Humans like stories and all schools have their stories. And I think school culture is encapsulated in the stories it tells and all members of a school community contribute to those stories as a school leader you have a far greater opportunity to help shape the narrative than you've ever had before so I would say listen to the stories ask about the stories as a head every time I stood up to give an assembly or make a presentation to staff or parents or students or whatever it was I think I was telling some of my story and the school story about what there and how we were going to live how we were going to treat each other speak to each other our our protocols our practices our policies would all align with our story um I love the quotation in the book from Deal and Peterson that says stories are the language of leadership I think if you're a leader at any level think about the stories you tell think about what you model and how you have the capacity to to shape the narrative of the domain in which you're leading, the school you're leading, that people have to listen and think and learn and not let their preconceptions get in the way of, of really appreciating this, this is 
how this school works. This is how it feels. This is what it believes. This is what it stands for. Yes, that is somewhere I will be happy working or I will be very happy for my children to be educated there. So, the, so in that case, how do we bring the right people into our culture? And I don't just mean um, our colleagues. Um, how do we bring you know, the right families, the right, the right teachers, the right governors, you know, the the right people into our community? What's the? Is there a process that you would say this is the right way of doing it? Or how do we go about um, creating more of what we love? I think that if we are clear. And we do communicate very effectively what we believe in, what we stand for. Then you attract people, don't you? You you appeal to parents. You attract potential members of staff. You would attract people who would want to get involved in, in, in governance of the school. So it's about being clear about it, about understanding it, about communicating it. As a head, whenever I was involved in appointments, I used to enjoy staff appointments. It was one of the, the great pleasures of the role, trying to get the, the right people on the bus, to use Jim Collins' words. Um, I think you need to be very discriminating. I think you need to be very insightful and aware so that you are, and it's an, it, it isn't a group thing, thing, Barry. You don't just want people who see the world as you do. You don't want lots of people who think the same thing. But in terms of ethos, in terms of values, there needs to be a coherence, a consistency and alignment. And I think you need also to be, I was very mindful that whenever we did make an appointment and internal appointments particularly, but even external, you delight one person when you offer them a post and you disappoint the others. Every unsuccessful applicant for a job in your school is a potential ambassador for your school. And you want them out there in the wider community, you know, in your case, in the international community, saying things like, well, I was disappointed because it was a great school. I would have loved to work there, but they treated me well. It was a really clear, transparent, fair process. It was positive. It was constructive. I got feedback. I felt better about myself at the end, even though I didn't get the job than worse. And I think when you clearly communicate those sorts of messages, it's very good for recruitment because people think actually that's a school that values its staff that develops its staff it grows its leaders it, it invests in people that's where I want to be so whether you're a parent a student a governor a member of staff if you get the culture right then it, it has lots of spin-off benefits I would say that's super interesting I think the uh, especially internationally where you're looking at people coming into and out of a city and and what you're looking for is reputation uh, to both as an academic as a as a scholastic enterprise but also as a place to work because finding great people internationally to come and work with you who are going to stay and what you want is people staying with you you know four five six years um to build their career and to really invest in the school and i think that's you you're really um uh, I mean, you're hitting home with some of the things you're saying here. And I'm also thinking about our own HR uh, approaches and what we could do differently. And I think it's it's making uh, and, and ensuring that everyone, when they come through the college or through the school, has a great experience. I think this is something I've always tried to do with uh, parents who come to us who are perhaps not going to send their children to us. And I do try to to talk to them about their children other ideas and to to leave them at the very least you know even if they just come for a visit with a feeling that we've listened uh we've wanted to help and we've wanted to you know give something back uh to them uh, that will help them on on their journey because that's what this is i suppose it's it's a journey but that that journey in terms of of culture um and and continual development of culture how can we how can we keep kind of touching on it is it things like you know uh induction is it staff development is it um you know the the professional reviews that we do how do we how do we keep is it a case of tinkering or do you have to have a, a reset sometimes with with school culture well it depends what you inherit doesn't it it goes back to the question about the legacy that you step into i think as a new head um, I do quite a lot of work with, with new heads and aspiring heads. And I think it's quite useful sometimes to say, 
when did we last have some kind of audit of how our marketing and communications is working, of how well our governance is working? And I, mean, I, I don't, I don't much like the word audit. I prefer the word <laughs> review. But it's giving you a baseline, yeah. and it's just saying, okay, what's going well? What could go better? What are the mm. people's perceptions? Sometimes we are so close to our schools, Barry, we can't clearly see how well things are working and where we could perhaps improve. But as a new leader, it's a really good opportunity to say, let's just stop and take stock. Let's have a look at how things are. Let's get some external expertise in here to help us see it more clearly. And then let's respond to what we learn. So we evaluate, we review, we consider, we discuss, and then we think, well, that's working really well. Let's do more of that. That could work better. What can we learn? What ideas can we tap into? You know, how can we continue to develop? So we avoid complacency. Um, we avoid thinking, well, that's always worked before. That's how it's always been done. So that's therefore how it should always be done. And we're much more challenging of ourselves, I suppose, about uh, are we hitting the mark? Um, is our culture well-known, well-articulated, fit for purpose? Or really, is it time for some evolution now? Because, because vision and values don't stay absolutely still. I think they do evolve. They respond to changes in society, new challenges, whatever that might be. And again, it's good to be nimble. It's good to be adaptable. So I think we need to see that this is a constant work in progress. <laughs> and and, and the, even if you come into a school where everything seems to be wonderful, I mean, it it won't be. One of the things I say to new heads is don't go in and try to reassure people by promising that you won't make changes. So, you know, I'm not going to change anything in the first year. You have no idea what might need to be changed. And sometimes things will come out of the woodwork because people will say, oh, new head, new chance to kind of raise this issue and, and get something done. So, the pace of change needs not to be too rapid. You need not to frighten the horses, but it needs not to be too slow either because you do need to make your mark, have an impact, leave the school stronger than you found it. That's what every head, that's the legacy we should leave <laughs> behind us, that it is in some ways stronger than we found it, but I would expect my successor to go on and make it stronger still. That's fantastic. I think the, the it reminds me of... Um... Uh, father Chris Brown, um, who uh, I work with in my first teaching job at Epsom, and um, and there was a conversation as a young buck. I was I sat quietly as the uh, the the older uh, masters um, talked, and one mentioned the, uh, the the head, and Father Brown just turned and said, "Dear boy, they're just passing through," um, mm -hmm. and it was very much about I think the the institution. Um, what you can do while you're there and, and what you can leave for others to then to then build upon it's that yeah. you know standing on the shoulders of others so, yeah I well, must just I must hmm. mention here Barry there was a brilliant blog post that I read last week um, it's by someone it's a, a, a head in in South Gloucestershire and he tweets at South Gloss head um, and it's called the, the, it was called Wacker Papa which is wasn't a phrase that I've ever heard before um, and it was Waka Papa reflections on our moment in the sunlight and what Simon the head's name is what Simon said in the blog is this apparently Waka Papa is a Maori belief you ever heard of it uh, I have not but I'm going to no. look it up after this, 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 <laughs> this, this session a, a Maori <laughs> belief that we stand arm in arm with those who went before us and those who will come after us so we currently stand in the sunlight as our ancestors did before us and future generations will do when our moment in the sun has passed. So it is about humility. It is about standing on the shoulders of giants. It's about respecting what has, has happened in the past. I mean, my school was founded in 1882, as many, um, many girls' schools were then in the Victorian era by some amazing, driven, talented women who believed that the education that boys had enjoyed for centuries should should be enjoyed by girls too and I think we need to to be very mindful of that rather than thinking we are the source of all the good ideas all the, the innovation and initiative but really we are we are here for a relatively short time I was ahead for 10 years 
My school had already existed since 1882. I hope it will continue to exist for centuries to come. And I think that needs to give us just a sense of we are important, but we're not so important that actually we are trying to dwarf or shadow the achievements of others. Fantastic. I'm looking that up uh, when we finish this uh, this recording. Um, I'll send you a link to the blog. Uh, that'd be lovely. Blog. Well, maybe we can... There's an assembly in there as well. I, we'll I like uh, we can have assemblies we, in. We can add this. I'll see if we can add this to the uh, the the eventual blog, uh, the eventual podcast posting, and um, get people uh, kind of tuning in and listening to that as well. I mean, when we when we come to to school culture, and I'm just conscious of time. We've been talking for over well over half an hour already. I, the the idea of measurement in education is something that frustrates me immensely. I think um, I I remember a, a head who, who used to tell me anything that can't be measured can't be managed, which I think is nonsense. Um, uh, but the when it comes to things like school culture, can, two questions, I suppose: Can we measure it, and actually, should we? Um. I know why you are frustrated. I think we have to be very careful. In the past, we've fallen into the trap of, of valuing what's measurable <laughs> yeah. rather than what's important. And some of the things that are very important, very difficult to measure. And I think that school culture, um, vision, values, beliefs, priorities are difficult to measure and evaluate. But the danger is that if we don't review and evaluate what we do, and then adjust and adapt it in the light of what we learn, we may not achieve what we hope to anyway. Uh, so I think I've already mentioned the idea of getting in some expertise from outside just to, to help us review where we are, what's going well, what could go better. Um, we can do surveys ourselves. I think with the advent of SurveyMonkey, we, we've all got a bit carried away with surveys. I'm sure there is such a thing as survey fatigue, but we can actually easily gather views from staff, from pupils, from parents. I like conversations, I like focus groups, I like discussions, I like listening, noticing, building your awareness. In my first term of headship, I had 20 minute discussions with individual members of staff. I got through the whole staff, it took a lot of time, but it, I learned a lot, but it also sent out a very important message. I want to know, I want you to tell me, give me the benefits of your knowledge and understanding of the school. And I asked those people that I met to tell me one thing at the school that they hoped might change in my tenure and one thing that they hoped would never change. So I learned a lot about maybe niggles and frustrations and opportunities to improve. But I also learned a huge amount about what was was valued, what, what was the USP of the school, if you like. And I remember one member of staff who was a part time member of the P department. And she said, before I tell you my two things, can I just say I've been here for 11 years. She was a parent of a girl there too. She said, I've never had a one-to-one -one discussion with the head before in 11 years. And I have never been asked what I think about the school. And I remember after she'd gone out, I thought this was so worth doing for that comment alone, because it sends a message that you are keen to evaluate. You do want to learn and you do want to build on what you find out in order to make the school stronger. So my answer is yes, we, we should measure it, we should evaluate, and then we should act on the information that we get. We need to, we need to show that we are visible, approachable, human, interested. We should do exit interviews for every member of staff who leads, leaves us, Barry. So many schools don't. And it, they have to be organized in such a way that we really do get an honest appraisal of what's gone well, what they've been disappointed by or frustrated by, and use that information in order to improve what we do. We have to listen, especially when we perhaps don't quite like what we're hearing. That's when it's really important to listen. And that's to students and to staff and to parents, to everybody, because we have a responsibility to try and do the best possible job we can and to serve the community, which was a word you used before. So we need to be evaluating and we need to be constantly adapting and improving. And as Dylan William puts it, not because we're not good enough, but because we can all be even better, but we have to embrace that and be responsive and receptive to that. And heads have to model that from the top. 
Absolutely, I think you, you're. I think you're. You're spot on the money. I think for for me at the moment, uh, my my own school is a is a startup school. So I'm at the absolute other end of that journey. So our school was founded in in the 2020s, uh, as opposed to the 1820s. Um, the but the I think for me the most valuable experiences I have had have been group meetings with staff talking about the issues that we face as a startup school and how we want to progress, and then the the individual one to ones where I you know talk with with teachers and staff from across the school administration catering etc everybody to to look at new ways of doing things and and different ideas and uh a colleague, actually a very smart colleague, said exactly the same thing. He said, okay, it's fine. We can innovate. We can move forward. We can develop. You know, we can take on more students and, and you know, make sure the school flourishes. But we have to make sure we don't lose what is currently making the school a very special place to be. And I think that's Definitely. the, uh, that's, that's a, that's a, that was a key thing for me anyway. Yeah. No, what, sorry. Yeah. No, I, I, I heard it. I heard an inhalation there. I interrupted. <laughs> sorry. I just wanted to mention appreciative inquiry. When I did my um, doctoral reading and research, mm. I came across something called appreciative inquiry, which I hadn't really heard of before. It's a, it's a credit model of improvement, which says that often, if we want to, to improve things, we, we will get further if we consider what's working and how we can do more of it and not mm. allow ourselves to get obsessed with what's broken and how can yeah. we fix it. And this idea of asking people, you know, what do you appreciate? What are you proud of? What have you achieved? Especially post pandemic, you know, use a sort of KISS acronym. What can we keep? What can we improve? What do we need to start and what do we need to stop? Mm. Because we need to make the most of that experience to say, actually, some of the things we did, we were forced to do, actually worked well and we need to continue them. And there are other things that we need to review. But making sure we give ourselves credit for what's going well, what, what we achieved, what, what we are particularly proud of is really important. And listening to everybody, a head who was a good mentor to me, she was actually on, on my governing body. So she was a former head. She said a sign of a really good school, Jill, is where the least experienced member of staff can have an idea or a viewpoint and know they will be taken seriously. Nobody will say, you know, you haven't earned your stripes yet. Get back in your box. They will listen because we can learn from everyone, and we need to be open to that. I, I again, I mean, this is yeah, we're we're of a mind with this. I think um, I've had some really fantastic mentors who, you know, like Father Father Chris when I was very young. Yeah, you know, he was uh, coming to the end of his career twenty years ago, um, or yeah, you know, even most recently, um, yeah, you know, the marketing, uh, social media. Um, uh, um, um, manager at uh, when I was working in Dubai, um, uh, head of Chinese when I was working in Shanghai, uh, the Arabic uh, team when I was working in Dubai as well. So, you know, both kind of our practical, operational, you know, cultural mentors um, who were who are absolutely fantastic. And I think you, you you have to make sure you're doing something difficult every day. And you also have to make sure as, as I think as a leader of a community that you're learning something about that community every day and making sure you're taking interest in and, and, and moving forward personally, as well as helping that community to move forward you know, as a community. Definitely. Um, I, I think the one of the things that um, I know we like to do on these podcasts is to to get kind of takeaways um and i'm i'm going to talk for a little bit to give you a moment to kind of gather your thoughts about what you want people to take away from from listening to us discuss this about school culture uh about how to implement it maybe about how to how to protect it about how to think about it um so for you what are the what are the maybe three or four it doesn't have to be three or four it could be seven it could be two what are the, the things you really want people who are listening to us now to take away from this discussion that are going to help them in their dealing with school culture, with it, be it you know a new school, be it in a new place, be it coming into a place that has a, a culture that's been extant for the last four centuries? What should people take from us today that's going to help them going forward? I think some of the things we, we've already talked about to some extent. Um, Michael Fullan is quoted in the book as saying that, that culture is the guiding beliefs and values evident in the way the school operates. So it's making sure that we know our culture should, should, should guide us, it should help us, it should direct us. As we've said 
particularly maybe in challenging times, but actually all, all the time. So I think that's really important. The idea of valuing the staff, um, I was thinking about this when you were speaking earlier about, we, we often say the kids come first, it's all about the kids. I, I stopped saying that because I read a very good book called Putting Staff First by John Thompson and Johnny Utley. And I think they deliberately chose quite a provocative title because we, we do say so often, but it's all about pupils. And they make a very compelling argument to say that unless we invest in our staff, teaching and support staff, leaders across the organization, we can't reach the children. <laughs> we can't do it as lead, senior leaders and heads. We can't do what needs to be done to give the pupils what they need and deserve. So valuing, developing, investing in staff, uh, giving time, thought, attention to how we recruit, how we induct, how we retain, how we support professional development and learning is really, really important. And I think being open to flexible working is an important part of that. So that's the second thing, really. Um, and in terms of, you mentioned professional review. I don't really like the word appraisal, which lots of schools still use, because I think appraisal very much seems to be focused on judgment, really, doesn't it? Um, and yeah. accountability. I don't have a problem with accountability. We all need to be accountable. But I think that it should be professional review. When you observe a lesson, for example, it should never be to, to judge, to grade, heaven forbid, to criticize, because it's a snapshot. You can't accurately gauge how successful learning is by dropping into a lesson and looking at the teacher performance. So any observation, any review should be about opening a dialogue, encouraging reflection, mutual learning the per person who's observing will be learning some things as well as through the discussion with the person who's observed and development it's all about development so these are the things that i think are really critical to a very strong healthy school culture and if you feel that's fine i know that i'm doing this that's great but we need constantly to be looking at how we can do it better what's working well how can we do more of it so i hope that's helpful barry Oh, that's fantastic i think um you've you've given us i think and me especially um lots to think about going into the new year as uh, and good luck to everybody if you're starting a new school if you're starting to lead a new school i would encourage you to connect with jill on on linkedin through twitter uh definitely connect with me if you want to uh, have a chat about what you're doing especially if you're moving to countries that i've been in and we can connect you with with other people who have taught out there who have led out there wherever it may be um, across the world there's some amazing opportunities out there for educators for educational leaders I think I'm going to finish with with one question before we wrap up, uh, Jill. And this is something I think gets asked quite a lot on these podcasts. It's it's if you were going to uh, start a a school, or if you were going to set up a school, if you were going to move into a headship somewhere, could be around the world, it could be something new here. What's the one thing you would take with you? What's the is it could be a totem, it could be you know a great brand of coffee. What's the thing you can't live without? Um, there's there's a book I think you know I'm an English teacher I like books um I don't know whether you, you come across this it's called The Teaching Life by Robin McPherson and, and Kate Jones yeah I've read it, it yeah th there's a chapter in it isn't it about working international and they also yeah. run a website about leading an international school I think it's a very good summary of all the things that matter most particularly in terms of supporting people's professional learning and, and career progression so i would i would take that book i would share <laughs> the book and i would say this is all about making sure that we do everything in our power so that the people we work with because leadership is about building the capacity and confidence of the people we work with it will help us to do that and if you can get that right other things will fall into place so the teaching life is what i would take with me Fantastic. Thank you so much. So um, it's for me to wrap up our podcast today. Thank you very much to our partners, TRC Recruitment. So if you are looking for quality teachers to add to your team, or if you're looking to make an exciting move to a new position, do make TRC Recruitment uh, one of your choices. And you can go to www.ticrecruitment.com for more details. Um, it's for me to say thank you very much to Dr. Jill Berry. Um, it's been amazing. Are we going to see you anywhere else in the next uh, couple of weeks? Jill? 
uh, perhaps not in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> I'm actually having um, a knee replacement operation very shortly and another one the following year. So I'm going to be a little bit quiet for a while, although it's not going to stop me doing online work. Fantastic. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I will I'll, see me on Twitter. I'm a fairly uh, manic tweeter, Barry. So I'll always be there. I'm following you this afternoon, so I'm going to see you there. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Jill. And uh, do tune in for our next edition, which will be next month. And that's going to be with uh, Catherine Place, who is the head teacher at Jubilee Park Primary School. Take care, everybody. And uh, remember, the future belongs to you. Bye-bye now. Thank you, Barry.